Good morning and welcome to my show, Moments with Melinda. I am your host, Melinda Moulton, and today I am overwhelmed and so excited to have as my guest, Daniel Hecht. How are you, Dan? I'm pretty good. Yep. Yeah, so far, so good. <laughs> Doing well. I want to thank you so much for being on my show. To my viewers, let me tell you a little bit about Daniel Hecht. Dan is an author, environmentalist, musician, nonprofit organizational development consultant, educator, project manager, grant writer, and administrator for educational, environmental, and arts initiatives. And I know there's a lot more that you do, but that's is that pretty good? A pretty good overview. Yeah. yeah, that's what I've been doing for the last twenty or thirty years, anyway. <laughs> Well, well, you know, let's start by going back in time to your your early days and talk to me a little bit about your life growing up and maybe a little bit about somebody who inspired you in your life. You know, it's very interesting. I was fortunate to be born into an unusual community in New York State. Uh, this was back in 1946. My mother and father moved to uh, Croton Falls, New York, not Croton on Hudson, a little town uh, near the uh, Connecticut border. And they got an old house, a house from the 1730s, uh, and moved in there. And it was just after the war. And so they had moved uh, to Washington, D.C. from Chicago, and they had a lot of wonderful friends from Chicago uh, uh, who rallied around a group centered at the Art Institute of Chicago. So they're all artists. They're bohemians. There are people who look like anarchists, had beards, and they're all painters and photographers and writers and musicians. And uh, what happened was, for whatever reason, after the war, a number of them congregated around my parents in that community. Um, there, there was nothing formal. It had no community name. It wasn't a cult or a commune. What happened was their friend Al and Keith, who had been in the army, uh, got out and came up there to visit and loved the area so much, very rural area, um, and uh, found an old building, huge old brick building, way out in the woods. And it was the ideal artist's loft. Um, so Al and Keith moved in, and they spent their army discharge pay buying this huge old abandoned factory building and seven acres in Westchester County, New York, for $2,000. <laughs> so they moved in there and over many, many years fixed it up. It, an interesting site. So that's where I was born. And around them, oh, then my my uh, aunt moved there and they, he, she and her husband were ceramic artists. And then a uh, famous uh, uh, Al married somebody and her father was a famous sculptor and he bought some land adjoining theirs. And so pretty soon there's this whole community of social uh, oh, outsiders. Um, bohemians, artists, um, uh, liberal political sentiments, uh, communistic, and yet fiercely independent also. Um, interestingly enough, the, the, to uh, cut to one of the chases is my father's best friend was Keith and Al also. But uh, interestingly, later on, Keith had, a, uh, uh, had two kids. I ended up marrying Keith's daughter, and we've been married for 31 years. Uh, so my wife is my father's, the daughter of my father's best friend. We have two sons. Uh, so the tradition continues here in Vermont. So I grew up oh, surrounded by people who were very capable. It was a, a tiny Florence in the, in the woods of Westchester. Um, my father was in international public relations. So he traveled all over the world to the Philippines, to Venezuela, to to Ceylon, to Hong Kong, to, uh, oh, I don't know, everywhere, Ecuador, uh, Ethiopia. Um, and he mainly worked for governments, uh, helping the government promote new programs. Uh, so that was what he did for a living. He's the only one who had any money, but even his money was hit and miss. If he had a good contract, he, they, they had money. Everybody else was poor as church mice. Um, but uh, Keith, my father and eventual father-in-law, was a master carpenter craftsman. He did uh, museum uh, quality restoration of things. And he, uh, Al Goodspeed, who also bought into that great big building, uh, 
master carpenter and a fabulous oil painter. We have some of his uh, colorist paintings and so on. My aunt and uncle got hugely famous for their ceramics. They were on the cover of Life magazine. They, in the Brussels World's Fair, they have a, a permanent display in the Museum of Modern Art. So eventually they went on to this, uh, you know, an incredibly um, prolific, capable group. So when I was a kid, I grew up just learning by absorbing all this, you know, all these skills. How extraordinary. Learning yeah, so that's the that's the origins. My father died when I was three, though, and then my mother and uh, my three sibs and I moved all over the country, wherever it was she could find a job or find cheap living. So I, I was raised by a single mom, and uh, had three uh, older ki older siblings, all of whom are artists. And what did your mom do? Uh, she did whatever. She, she's a brilliant woman, um, uh, but she she. Um, did whatever she had to for a living. She was a secretary. It's the 1950s. Uh, women didn't make a lot of money then. They don't make enough now. But she did what she had to do to support four kids. So she was a secretary. She eventually became uh, head of various programs. Like she was head of the volunteer corps of Cook County Hospital in Chicago, world's largest hospital. I think they had 5,000 volunteers to supervise. Good for her. But, um, yeah. So then later in life, she quit doing all that and just made a living off her art. Fabulous. Amazing. Yeah. Well, I'm a Katie Gibbs girl, so I can sympathize with your mom. Um, so now you lived in many, many places. Now, what yeah. brought you to Vermont and what keeps you here? Oh, well, I'll tell you. So um, remember, I was born in New York State, mm -hmm. but then I uh, moved to Wisconsin to a remote farmhouse there. Uh, no central heating or for a while, no running water. And I moved to rural Virginia, to Washington, D.C., then to rural Virginia, then to Chicago, then to north of Chicago, uh, I've lived in, oh, and I forgot to mention that I, I, when I was young, lived in the Philippines where my father had a contract. So I grew up in the Philippines. I learned to walk and talk in the Philippines, in Manila. And I've lived in California, Vermont. But what brought me here was uh, I just self-published an album of solo guitar music. Um, I had fallen in love with the guitar when I was 15. And classical guitar, Andre Segovia playing Masters of the Guitar. And so I studied on my own. Then I went to a conservatory for a while. I was pretty good. Then I started writing my own music for steel string guitar using classical technique. Um, I don't know if you ever heard of John Fahey, legendary guitarist. I'm, I actually have that in my in my interview. He was oh, John yeah. Fahey, we followed. He was yeah. my 60s idol. Oh, yeah. I, so, he was a cult figure in there, and uh, so I listened to John Fahey, and then this really snazzy player named Leo Kotke came along. Yes. And, you know, oh, my God. Um, I, I synthesized classical music and their music and Indian classical music and uh, um, English folk music uh, a lot in my solo guitar music. So what happened was I put out this album, self-published. Oh, I was encouraged by this guy named Moondog, Lewis Harden, a famous guy six feet tall, big beard, wore red clothes and a, and a Viking cap. And he was blind and he was a composer. Uh, and so Moondog lived with me and my roommates in Madison, Wisconsin at a farm we had there. So uh, Moondog had put out his own first album before he was recording on Columbia Records, along with the Beatles and Janis Joplin. Um, and uh, so he encouraged me to cut my own record the way he did. And so I did. And uh, then I was promoting this first horrible record, terrible music, horribly. I, I like to think it's carved by hand with a hatchet into the vinyl. But it, so I was traveling and I came to Vermont. I had an old girlfriend living, going to Goddard College. I fell so in love with the landscape and the people and the funky houses. And remember, this is 1973 and it was, you could live here for cheap. Or no, there's no work, <laughs> but you know, you, you could scrounge. And I did logging, I did got up firewood, you know, I did fix my own car, did everything, went hungry sometimes. So, where'd you settle in Vermont when you came to Vermont with your girlfriend? Where did you land? Well, I, I came to Plainfield. Okay. Uh, my ex girlfriend lived in, in there at Plainfield, but my current girl, girlfriend and I settled in Plainfield. 
where we were near Goddard and all the activities that Wonderful. Goddard brought to this rural area. So that's how I started. That's how you got here. So now, now you, you're a celebrate, you are an incredibly celebrated author and your eight novels are yep. published in 14 languages and over a hundred editions throughout the world. Yeah. You are an author of bestsellers. Can you talk to us a bit about your most recent novel, The Body Below from Blackstone Publishing, which has been coined a first rate mystery and beautifully written. Tell us a little bit about that book. Well, I appreciate the kind words. Yeah, so that that's the first book I've written um, that's really based here in central Vermont. My prior book, uh, I guess I should, uh, to back up a bit, I got, when my music career fell apart, I had to do something for a living and I figured I'd always been doing some writing and my musical things were mainly telling stories anyway. They're musical narratives, not riffs or grooves, you know. So when I, my hands fell apart, I couldn't play music. I couldn't record. I'd recorded three albums and I had traveled all over the world. Uh, I played throughout the United States, played at Carnegie Hall twice, um, uh, played throughout Europe because my records were released there. And then I did a solo tour of China in 1989. Uh, my hands had recovered enough and I wasn't going to miss that. And I came back from that and I put my... Um, put my uh, Guitar in the case, never took it out again, 1989. What? And then uh, I went to the University of Iowa Writers Workshop and got an MFA in writing. So and, let's back up. Yeah. So what? tell me a little bit about your hands and tell me, so you so you do not ever go and pick up your guitar and sit and strum? Never. No. So it's in the, it's in the, it's in its case and it's been there since 1989. Well, I sold it. <laughs> I had two so, two very very priceless handmade guitars that I sold. I, I have such a guitar. gifted musician, and so you're not, yeah. you're not you're not drawn to it. You haven't taken up a, a, a you know another you know piece of another instrument. So what what happened? How could that? What was it? Your hand? I don't know. Really interesting. Um, for a while, I was uh, I was playing, and I was playing with some really good people, really top form people. Michael Hedges. Uh, I toured with him, Alex Degrassi, George Winston, the pianist, uh, 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 was a good friend and played with him a lot. The um, but my my I had a psoriasis on my hands. I also had I was beginning to get arthritis and it was very painful to play. So that explains it. So, yeah. So you moved into into being a writer now. Yeah. So so um, I want to I I do want to talk about your books. Now you've got Brossard's Farm is a love story. It's set in Vermont. And yeah. Anne Turner is the main character. It's about accepting love. And this yeah. book was hailed as a wondrous, unique love story by Publishers Weekly. And then you did the Cree series, the Cree Black series. Um, and then I want to talk a little bit about Bones of Barbary Coast, uh, which has Cree identifying the remains of a victim of the great quake in San Francisco of 1906, which is named Wolfman. Um, so talk to us a little bit about your books. And I just want to tell you, then you did the the Babel effect, which is that explores the, the subtle mysteries of the mind of human values or spirituality and personal loyalty and love. And your first novel, Skull Session, became an overnight sensation, sent you into the top of the, the you know, the bestsellers list. And you were the worldwide bestseller. It is based on true events and cutting edge neuroscience. So my question to you is <laughs> your books. Your books are laced with science and mystery, psychological exploration, and deep mind-bending thrillers. Where do you draw your inspiration and mental okay. fortitude that that allows you to dive so deeply into your subjects and talk about these books a little yeah, bit? Yeah, you know, I, a you. lot of it's accidental, and I do. I would advise all writers to expect a certain measure of accident in in their careers. And in what they write, you know, what happened was I went to University of Iowa, best writing school in the world. I got out thinking I was hot stuff. And, you know, applied for, uh, you know, jobs at universities. And, you know, I finally applied to Skunk Gulch Community College in somewhere, Iowa, Idaho, and was told, yeah, thanks, Mr. Heck, we have 397 applicants, and of which 280 are PhDs. It turned out my MFA wasn't worth much in the field. So I knew a lot of really wonderful writers who weren't getting published or making any money. I had a funny story. Remember, we talked about where I was born, right, in that community. Well, <clears throat> one member of the community outlying 
was very, very wealthy. She had uh, inherited a lot of money uh, and had bought a former Vanderbilt hunting lodge way up on a hill. And I used to play there when I was a kid, and she and my mother were good friends. It was a very spooky place. This great big house. The living room was 50 feet square. The fireplace, you could park your Volkswagen in sideways, you know. Um, but we lost touch with her after many moves. And then when I was living here in Vermont, this is many years ago now, we got a call from her out of the blue. She said, oh, my house has been vandalized. I'm living in California now. She had lived up there alone. You know, the driveway's a mile long. And so she said, I don't, I hear all my stuff is getting ruined. And uh, Danny, uh, you know, she knew me as a little kid. Uh, can you go check? Because my mother told her I was a, a carpenter and wood, you know, cabinet maker. And uh, so I said, yeah. So I went down and it was horribly vandalized. Mm. I mean, it was uh, freakishly vandalized. The other thing was mysterious was she had left all her stuff there. I mean, talking about this 50 foot living room was three feet deep in mink coats and busted Louis cans chairs and every other expensive thing. And why would people just trash it instead of stealing it? I, you know, anyway, the, the walls are ripped open as if somebody had been looking for something and it goes on and on. And it was so scary a story. I would tell it at over dinner and people said, boy, that's the scariest thing I've ever heard. And so I, I finally said, well, you know, maybe I should just write a novel about that. So I did. And that was Skull Session. And uh, I, you know, I thought I was writing a literary novel later on. I had never read a thriller. I didn't know what a thriller was. I just read literary stuff. I thought I wrote a literary thing and it. I was fascinated with neuroscience. So I had uh, my main character was Turetic. And there's a reason for that. And so I, you know, I finished this book. And I sent it out. I get an agent. She puts it up and all of a sudden there's an auction with every major house bidding on it. And I basically ended up making about $2 million in my first two books. So it sounds like a lot of money, but you know, it takes a while to write those suckers in your for, agent. For an author, percent. for a writer, for an author, that's a lot of money back then. No doubt about it. You know, my, I had my first year uh, of, of getting that advance my income taxes were $387,000. I had never in my life in aggregate learned, earned that much money, let alone paid it in taxes. So yeah, by the easy come, easy go. So, uh, you know, so, I'm not, writing, I, so writing became your world, your work and yeah. your, and your income and you focused and you yeah. wrote eight, eight novels and yeah well that, that, i tell you it does you get hooked on it plus i found i really liked it when it's going well writing is the funnest bestest and when it's going badly it's hell you know but you're but you're really <laughs> accomplished you're an accomplished important uh writer and um so that's fascinating uh talk to me i i I want to talk a little bit about the Brassard's farm, the love story. Um, it's set in Vermont and Ann Turner is the main character. And as I said, it's about accepting love. Um, talk to us a little bit, because is, that's not your only book set in Vermont, or is it? Uh, let's see. Uh, well, it's the first one fully set in Vermont. And and uh, the newest one, The Body Below, is, is, is also set totally yeah, and, in Vermont. Yeah, so... Um, when I first moved to Vermont, uh, at some point I bought some really remote acres, you know, for 30 bucks an acre, way up on a mountain in Peachum Pond, uh, above Peachum Pond, way up on Hooker Mountain there. And I lived there summers, uh, six months of the year, uh, sometimes alone, because my girlfriend was finishing her uh, degree, uh, had a job in Madison, Wisconsin still. And so I lived out in really remote woods, bears and moose and, and mysterious things. And so... I've also worked uh, at manual labor. I've been a carpenter and a logger. Um, and then I got into, in my organizational development side, I spent a lot of time working on Vermont farm, dairy farm issues. Uh, so the story of that, that love affair or that study of love is a romantic love for sure, but it's also coming to love um, a place and to love through learning to work hard. 
she works harder. She eventually get, you know, buys this land, moves out, lives in a tent, and works on the dairy farm nearby. It's a small dairy farm, struggling as they all are, and learns to love hard work and the honesty and integrity that comes from hard work and the difficult parts of getting up at when it's 20 below out and going out to milk at 4 30 in the morning it's tough stuff and dealing with 120 pounds of manure a day from those cows is tough so i i really wanted to write a book that encapsulated some of the things i had learned from living in the deep woods and um to celebrate the wisdom and durability of rural peoples and rural experiences and women and women yeah um i it, it's interesting and a, a good question would be daniel you've written eight novels the cree black series were focused on a it were written in the woman's voice and turner's first person woman's voice the body below is half a woman and half a man written narrated by so what's that about and the answer that is I don't know. that was a question Turner. That was where I was heading is. Yeah. I and I, I don't know what it is. That's I didn't I didn't do that intentionally. With you have intention. a feminine side. You have. Are you in touch with the relationship with your mother being raised with a single mom? It could be you part of it. Of your mother and the strength of your mom. You know, nowadays we place such primacy on gender. Well, I'm gender fluid and I'm gender neutral. I'm non-binary. I'm, I'm they, I'm he, I'm she. And the horrible thing about that is it actually promotes a sense of there being hard barriers between genders. And I don't think anybody's that well-defined and simple in their makeup. How fascinating. Um, How I think fascinating. Uh, you feel I, that. I, you know, I just, the person who wanted to tell those stories happened to be a woman. Right. Um, I have received a few people say, how dare you, this guy doesn't know how women think. And my answer is what? Women think a single way? There's one way that women think? That's so sexist. It makes me sick. Mainly I get is Daniel's heck, what woman is a completely credible woman. How does he think that way? And I I don't, I just think like me, except that Ann Turner in in um, On Brass's Farm is a lot like Cree Black, the protagonist of her three books. Right. They're both sensitive, they're introspective, they're compassionate, they're courageous, they're vulnerable. Um, and so I, I, I love them very much. <laughs> so I and and I and your and your readers do too. I just for my viewers out there, we're talking with Daniel Hecht, who is who is an author, environmentalist, musician, a Renaissance man. But you can go to his website, which is Daniel Hecht, D-A-N-I-E-L-H-E-C-H-T dot com, and learn more about Dan and his books and his music. Now I want to I want to move uh, to the fact that you were a director of the Vermont Agency of Agriculture and that you produced the Farm Energy Handbook and you edited and co-wrote with twenty renewable energy experts. Talk to us about this work. What what moved you into this environmental work? Well, just to be to correct, I wasn't a director of the agency. I was a director of uh, Ver Vermont Environmental Consortium, which is a statewide nonprofit, right. green businesses and environmental stuff. We had all the colleges were members of that, uh, all the renewable energy companies and many more uh, engineering firms and so on. Um, I have ran that outfit for a number of years um, and then got to know everybody in renewable energy and in, especially associated with biodigestion, farm biodigestion. But uh, so when the Agency of Agriculture, I, I oh, I know where it came from. I put on a conference, major conference up at the Sheraton, uh, up in Burlington. 400 people came, uh, a lot of them farmers. It was called Agriculture and the Environment. And so one of the topics there was, of course, renewable energy for farms, you know, for what, what can farmers do? And it's not just biodigestion, but that's one th one aspect of it. But that's where I started working with farmers a lot. So after that, the Agency of Agriculture approached me and commissioned the, me to put together this book. Um, I, I called upon, oh, 20 or more experts in the field. Uh, we did, you know, uh, micro hydro, uh, micro wind, ethanol, biodigestion, conservation, efficiency, um, uh, you know, geothermal, uh, every kind of photovoltaics, passive solar, you know, et cetera. And it's all in that book it was the first of its kind. Um, 
Ben and Jerry's uh, donated the um, artwork uh, and the cover artwork and the printing. The agency paid for the printing. It's a good full color book. I'm very proud of it. Where can I, folks get it? Where can folks see that? Get you this? You can't book? get it anymore. There were only oh, yeah. five. Oh, that's five thousand were printed, and they were sent free to every farmer in Vermont. Magnificent! And all the legislators, um, and all the agency heads. You also, and you also did the green, the green makeover video, which you produced and scripted. Yeah. And eventually, your work led to the construction in twenty thirteen of a three point five million dollar food waste and manure bio digester. Yeah. Vermont Tech campus. I mean, you were not just writing about environmentalism. You were making stuff happen. Well, just I was. I got to know everybody. You know, I had a syndicated column for a while, for a couple of years, called The Green Grapevine. And it came out every two weeks. And I interviewed people uh, and learned about what they did. You know, they might be in renewable energy, or they might do put in a foam insulation, or they might be engineers, or they might be ecologists. If I had to do the environment, I got to know everybody in the state. So it was pretty nice. And so out of that, it it, it came pretty. I got to know Senator Leahy, Senator Sanders, uh, agency secretaries, the governor. I worked closely with the governor, lieutenant governor. So I went on international trade missions with Governor Douglas and Lieutenant Governor Brian Doobie. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, so I, I had my fingers on the pulse of what was happening. Oh, if, if, if developments in, uh, LEDs. Oh, I knew about that, you know, nanotech, uh, nanotech. I, I, I did an article about, uh, a company that was working to develop, uh, nanofiber water filtration things that you could, if you're in a drought area, you just have these straws and they're full of nanofibers and you can actually drink out of a mud puddle. You know, you know, a lot of stuff like that. Some of these some of these technologies worked, some didn't work so well, but um they uh so I had my finger on the pulse. So uh I worked with the waste district here and Vermont uh environmental uh, uh Vermont Tech, and we applied for and got a six hundred thousand dollar Department of Energy grant to study food waste to energy biodigestion. So we, I ran that program, that study for three years, and in which time Vermont Tech really wanted to build a biodigester. So we looked for another bunch of money, and they did build it on that campus. That's Never worked out though. Neither the study nor the the, um, the diod, but digester, for, unfortunately. So for a complicated technical reason. It, it, it is, and you know I I hear you, but we have to we have to do better. So talk to me. Dan, I want to talk to you a little bit about COVID and how this pandemic affected you and your views about the future of our humanity on a planet. <laughs> on a planet. <laughs> well, and we got to keep it short. I mean, we're definitely yeah. going to go over, but I want to go over with you. All I don't right. keep going over my time with you here. Uh, but I want your views about the future of our humanity on the planet, um, a planet which might prefer for us not to stay here. Yeah. Yeah. Um... Uh, COVID for, for us was kind of not so bad. We live in downtown Montpelier. Uh, we had a son who was uh, finishing high school and starting college. He had a girlfriend. And so he was part of, she was part of our pod of people who could come into our house, you know, so she was here a lot. So we had, we had enough social flow through. We never felt isolated. Um, and I, by nature, I was finishing up whatever book I was working on. I, probably finishing off on Brassard's farm and starting the, the body below. So I, I work at home anyway. So my consulting, I, I mostly am working from home. So I never. But, but about a pandemic, I mean, this fact that this, that the whole world stopped, just stopped. Yeah. Now in the Babel effect, uh, the people there, I studied epidemiology in the, to write the Babel effect. And I can tell you that for 30 years, every epidemiologist in the world is saying the planet is going to blow because it has every kind of, uh, all the mechanisms are in place for a global pandemic. Um, we, As it turns out, COVID became it. But we have a lot of transportation between cities. We have de people living densely together. We have constant exchange of goods and services all over the place. So Everybody's been saying for years that we're ready, and it's so hard for the public to accept. But science, was, but science stepped up, and look where we are today. Now, I also want to take you into the world of our democracy. 
<laughs> and and talk to you about how we can function in a society that's being fed lies by by everyone and what has happened to our country and where we are headed and how are you feeling about this about where we are because you're you were born in 1950 as was i so we've been through a lot right yeah. we've been through a lot in our in our in our 73 yeah. years but where do you see our country where we are right now uh, i'm not too i'm not too optimistic um what i don't like is that i don't like the uh look we 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 were creatures of the age of reason. There was this wonderful explosion of rationality in the 1700s. We had guys like Thomas Jefferson and Isaac Newton and all these lovely science types who, you know, were looking for, and on the basis of, of, of their understanding, we built secular democracies, which we found to be the, probably the best form of human society, social organization ever. Great. Uh, but now we have to doubt all science and fact. And I have for years studied psychology and neuroscience, and I still cannot understand the mechanisms by which um, belief is created or uncreated. And all I can learn from my studies now is that efforts to persuade people of something they don't want to believe backfire. It actually makes them believe it harder. Um, and in fact, a lot of anything that's forced on people, oh God, I just read a, a meta study of DEI trainings, diversity, equity, and inclusion trainings that big corporations do and universities do. Good thing, good, you know, let's accept people of all colors, shapes. You know what? They actually are county productive. Uh, downstream studies of people who've received them find them to be more prejudicial than before they had them. Why I don't it's something I don't know. Yeah, how I, I'm not real hopeful. I do not like the cultish uh, thing that's going on right now. This personality cult, the denial of any fact, uh, every fact. It's the there seems to be an erosion of faith in democracy. We actually want an authoritarian leader who will make everybody toe the line. Um, a lot of the world is falling that way. Look at India. Look at. Look at Pakistan. Look at you know. Look at Hungary. God. So okay. so so Dan, um, thank you for that. I appreciate that. What so? What words of wisdom would you give to our children and their children who will be living another 40, 70, 100 years from now on this planet? What's your words of wisdom for your own children and your well, grandchildren? Yeah, it's a, you're challenging me here. That's I am a, challenging you, my friend. I want to give yeah. you. Yes, I am. Well, I appreciate. It. Let me think for a second on that. I think. Learn a lot of skills. Put together a lot of skills. Don't don't uh, try to master your your physical and mechanical environment a bit. Learn to grow food because when systems break down, you'll get hungry and you wish you had it. I've been working with a group here in Montpelier. Uh, it's informal, but it's been six months now. We're really concerned about local food supply. Vermont really raises only about ten percent of its edible food. We say 20%, but most of that is alcohol, is beer and spirits. We did our, I don't mind those either, but you can't, you know, they're not much protein in them. So, you know, uh, keep some basic skills, stay stay physically fit, keep all your parts alive. Um, one thing that kids don't do anymore is read. Even my own sons don't do much reading. They listen to podcasts. But reading a book is a, a it strings together ideas in a flow that's you know important to maintain. It contextualizes. Keep the look at context. So what, what, what are you, so what are you working on now? What's your next project? You know, since the I completed uh, the um, the body below, a lot of what I had to do is marketing kind of stuff. Uh, unfortunately, the the book came out at, uh, at the very end of August, last day of August. But we were hit by the flood here in Montpelier on July 10th, including the building. I, I own a building in Montpelier. I live in one part of it. It's three houses stuck together. Well, one of the houses got flooded. It's below grade. So I had to go fix all that. I do all the carpentry, plumbing, and wiring myself. So I did it all myself. Uh, and then there's dealing with the Small Business Administration, FEMA, and our car, a wonderful irony, our car, which was just fine, but it had some cosmetic work, was at the body shop. If it hadn't been here, it would have been fine, but it got flooded at the body shop. And we like that Subaru Outback. 
bam. And then we went through two months of fighting with the insurance company who didn't want to reimburse us for it. So I don't know. It was a, it was a long, hard summer. So, what do you, so, so do you have a book that you're working on now or are you taking? You know, I, I actually have one I've been working on for many years and it's called my father's novel. And it, it's uh, almost magical realist. It is based in the present, a guy kind of like me in the present and flashing back to that, that period in the late forties and early fifties and my parents and their artistic community fascinating people, amazing ad adventures and misadventures, constant poverty, constant uh, reassurance in, in finding others of their same ilk. So uh, it's I've got about 350 or 400 pages of it. Ah, and I just have to write another 100 or so pages of it. That'll be fine. Well, it's, <laughs> it's, a, good, it's a good time to do that. It's winter and we're all sort of, you know, yeah. hustled in here and well, you know, Dan Hecht, I want to tell you how privileged I am to have you on my show and to share your story with my viewers. And I'm just delighted to get to know you better. Please put me on your mailing list if you're going to do any readings or you're going to, you know, whatever, anything you do, I would love to be become your new fan, your new groupie. Um, and thank you for sharing your life and your work and your wisdom with me and my viewers today. Thank you so much, my friend, for being with me. Oh, this has been fun. I, I hope I've answered some of the questions. You've been magnificent. <laughs> magnificent. I'm so delighted. And to my viewers, I hope you're all doing well after this last storm we had and that your power has been restored. And I want to wish you a happy new year. And thank you for tuning in and um, into my show. And I will see you all soon. Thank you very much.